Hey everybody. So as part of this new uh, occasional offbeat author interview series, uh, the other day I had a chance to uh, do a Zoom conversation with a fellow named Ted Bell. Uh, now Ted Bell uh, is an advertising legend from places like Leo Burnett and Doyle Dane Birnbach. And it, it just one of those people who was just instrumental in advertising during the, uh, the, the 60s and the 70s. And, um, but now he's a thriller writer. He's, uh, his latest book is called Dragonfire. And it's a, uh, a James Bond type of novel. Uh, it's, it's just a rollicking good time. It, it is a yarn, as I, as I told her. That was my reaction to it. And we talked a little bit about the novels and we talked about how he works. But one of the things I want you to pay attention to is when he talks about the importance of storytelling. And there's certain commonalities uh, in storytelling that go from advertising to a, you know, 400 page novel. As you all know, I talk a lot about storytelling here on Morning Newsbeat and why it's important for, for brands, whether you're a retail brand, a manufacturer brand, to be able to tell a convincing and persuasive and com compelling story to consumers if you want them to, uh, to be your customers. Uh, so here's my conversation with novelist Ted Bell. Ted Bell, welcome to Morning Newsbeat. Thank you, Kevin. Great to be here. So, one of the things I loved, and I and I, uh, this is the first of your Alex Hawk books that I that I read. Uh, it's called Dragonfire, and um, one of the things I loved about this book is I just got the sense in reading it that you were having a great time writing it. It just seemed like such a great yarn. Yeah. Well, I was having a great time because I. I've got a house, that, I'm in, in Greenwich now, as you know, but I have a house in Charleston, South Carolina. And I was locked in my office for like four and a half months or something. But I had this every day to fall back on. And I was, I just had a great time during the whole lockdown. I, I was just like creating this book. So you wrote this during the lockdown. So this came out yeah. very quickly then. Yeah. Well, I had started it earlier, but I was nowhere near finished. So I realized if I could finish this thing during this lockdown, then I can move on to the next one after this. So, the uh, um, now you started in the advertising business. Was writing novels always sort of the the long game, or was it the, yeah. the thing you came to after you retired from advertising? No, no, no. I, 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 I at eight years old, third grade, I started writing short stories, and I don't know where it came from. I, I was it was kind of an unconscious thing that I just did. And um, I was talking to the Charleston Literary Society and they said, tell us, tell us about that. And I said, well, you know how when you see like a six-year-old Chinese kid sits down at a big uh, grand concert grand piano and starts playing Bach, <laughs> you know, that's kind of how it was. I just, I'm not saying, I, I'm just, I just, just started writing. And I, you know, I, I, the, only, the only things I knew of anything about then at age eight were cowboys were huge for me. Right. And UFOs were really big in that period. So I would write stories where it was a cattle drive from Missoula, Montana to another place. And UFOs would like hover over the cowboys and tractor beam them out of the saddles and up in, into the sauces. And that was what I was writing. And so, and I was, I was so happy writing those things, you know? They say write uh, what you know, so what, what that- Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I, I didn't know anybody anything but flying saucers. And, and where did you grow up? Where, were you, where was this? Mostly in Florida. But um, I lived in New Orleans a couple of times, which I love that town. And, um, and yeah, but I would say mostly in Florida. So are there common elements of storytelling um, uh, that kind of follow you from advertising? Admittedly, you're doing an advertising, you're doing it on a page, or you're doing it in 30 or 60 second snippets, and this is clearly very different than that. Right. But are there commonalities in terms of storytelling that you that you can? Yeah, see? no, I, absolutely, and I think that's. Um, I've I've never had more fun than when I was in advertising in, until now. But when you're doing a sixty or ninety second cinema commercial, or sometimes two minutes, and I always I I didn't like commercials where you go, yes, it's got more words than any other book. You know, it's, I that's I didn't do those. I did stories like for Hallmark and and Volkswagen and because I was always a storyteller. And so what I, what I learned from those years, you know, we were shooting commercials all over the world at Pinewood Studios with uh, David Lean 
and Ridley Scott and Tony Scott, his brother, and all these guys. And so storytelling was paramount to me. And so I knew I had to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I knew I had to have, in that short a period, instantly identifiable characters that you can either uh, embrace or not. You know, it's, is it the dumb dad and the smart mom, or is it, you know, the brother and sister who don't like you? I don't know. Whatever it was, you had to bring those characters to life in a very short period of time. And then you had to have a story that would engage people and they'd want to sit around until it was over to find out what happens. Uh, I, already, I sort of already knew all that, uh, but it really got reinforced in the, in the production of endless commercials all over the world. But the real secret, I think, was comic books. Uh, and I think comic books were a nickel then, I think, or something like that, or a dime. And I had a dollar a week allowance. And I had like vast cities of comic book piles of everything, you know, from Archie to Superman, Batman. And I would just, you know, I'd get in bed and read comics until I fell asleep every day of my childhood. Um, sorry, we got a little Joe Biden input. Right. <laughs> Honey, can you hit that, turn it off? That's <laughs> okay. So, so I think I, I was having so much fun reading those comic books, but it never occurred to me that I was learning the basics of storytelling over and over and over and over again. All the things I just talked about, believable characters, uh, beginning, middle, and an end. It was always, a, you know, I met, uh, tell me if I'm running on too long, but I met, oh. Robert, I, I met Robert Downey Sr. at a cocktail party in New York when I was just getting ready to, to, to leave New York and, and go to Chicago. And I found myself standing next to him and I just started talking to him. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm in advertising. He said, how's that? I said, I don't know. I, it's, you know, it's not what I really want to do, but I love it. I'm having fun. And he, I said, he said, what do you want to do? I said, I really like to be a serious writer. And he said, well, okay. And I said, can you just think about it for a second and give me one sentence that defines what you think is the essence of good storytelling, especially in the novel form? He said, yeah, sure. So you create a remarkable hero that's very engaging and, and people love the guy. And then you introduce him and, and win, win their hearts. And then you just put one incredible obstacle after another in his way that he has to surmount in order to emerge victorious at the end of the book. And I said, hello? I mean, that's like, that's like somebody handing you the, 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 you know, the secret uh, to life, you know? Well, it also sort of defines his son's later career. Go for yeah, it. right, exactly. Um, well, and it's interesting, and comic books are interesting because they're so visual, right? They're not, I mean, they, 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 they have, have a visual quality to them. Yeah. That is, oh, and, and highly distinctive. You, the, yeah. A DC comic book never looked like a Marvel comic book. No. They were very, they, boy, they have their brand identities. Yeah. 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 One of my, one of the things I talk a lot about on Morning Newsbeat is the notion that too many stores are alike. That you walk it, you, you, many stories. If you were in there and you didn't know if you were in Kevin? a, yeah, um, if you didn't know if you what kind of Kevin? story you were in, you'd have no idea, right? Because they're not distinctive. And and I so I always think that's a I think that's a great lesson to pass on. We're, we're, this book is sort of a um, a throwback in so, I think to me it feels like that in part because it it unfolds in two different timelines. There's a, there's a World War II portion of it, and then there's the modern day portion of it. I read it, and part of my reaction was, there's like enough plot in here for three different novels, right? <laughs> there's like two novels in the World War II section, and then there's another novel in the modern day section. Did it ever occur, was that sort of conscious? I'm just gonna get as much stuff in here as I can? No, I think that, um... When I, when I started doing it, I, I somehow just came to me this idea, of why not go back to 1941 and, and have my hero, Alex, Lord Alexander Hawke, make it about his grandfather, also being in the Royal Navy in World War I, and assigned to the Chinese embassy in Washington, uh, and becoming best friends with FDR. But what is revealed is that I mean, he went to Cambridge and Oxford and he got degrees in American political thought and, and American uh, political history. And he was from one of the oldest Chinese mafia families in, in China. And he had been- Not bred. a hero, a hero's friend. Yeah. Right. Say it again? 
I, I don't want people to think your hero is from a, a Chinese mafia family. The no, 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 no. No, he, no okay. Hawk is a hero. Right. And Hawk's grandfather is a hero. Right. Uh, but I think that guy is really an interesting character. Yes. Uh, and so, so I just thought, God, if I, if I go back to then and I have Hawk's grandfather, you know, who's a Brit and, and uh, a Royal Navy officer, I could bring in Churchill. I could bring in other famous people from World War II. <laughs> one of whom we will not give away. No, we will not talk about that. It's one of the coolest moments in the book when you yeah. interview somebody who's a real, uh, a, cool. a real character. Yet it, the, the World War II stuff had a real, and I mean this as a, as a total compliment, a real Guns of Navarone feel to it. Yeah, well, and Alice McLean, I love yeah, Alice. Right, it had, it had a, a great feel about that. Now you also write a different, another series of novels, yeah. right? They're young adult but, novels? Young adult books, right. What are those about? Um, they're about a character named Nick McIver, who is 11 years old, and his sister Kate, who's nine, and they live on one of the Channel Islands. Their father is a lighthouse keeper. And what they find out is that he not only is a mild-mannered lighthouse keeper, but he has a pistol in his drawer and a stack full of letters between him and Winston Churchill, because he's from his lighthouse tower, he's keeping track of all the U-boat activity in the Channel Islands and having it that, that intel shipped across the channel to Winston to just keep him apprised of what the Nazis are doing in the Channel Islands. And they say, and the kids say, Dad, can we be spies too? And so, so they become spies. And, uh, and then there's this element of time travel, uh, which allows him to go anywhere. Um, and the, the, the first two of the, of the trilogy are done, I'm gonna write a third one. But in Time Pirates, which we are now getting ready to pitch to studios and episodic television, you know, uh, streaming, uh, it's got Nazis, it's got pirates, it's got Nick going back to uh, Mount Vernon, dressed as a, as a Nick British, because he can travel in time, and dressed as a British drummer boy, and trying to get to Washington. To, to General Washington and tell him that uh, that he was in Port Royal, Jamaica to rescue his sister from an evil pirate. And he overheard them say that they were gonna form a vast pirate armada and keep the French from arriving at Yorktown to bail out the uh, to, to bail out Washington because he had no more money to pay the troops. He's running out of ammunition. Right. And they're gonna stop him. And had 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 those pirates succeeded, the America would not exist. So Nick just had to get to watch. And of course, Washington didn't believe a word he's saying when he starts talking about it. He went to Jamaica. Uh, but but, but, uh, but uh, the French Marquis de Lafayette is also at, at, at Mount Vernon that night, and he believes him. And he says, let's go back there and use your machine, if it really exists, and I'll help you. We'll defeat the pirates. So it's that kind of stuff. It's just, it's... This is the know. stuff that didn't make it into Hamilton, is in other words. Yeah, well, I, I never saw him. <laughs> but I was just, my, my pro, I was living in London and my daughter was in the fourth form and I went into her library and she's reading all these R.L. Stein books and Susie gets a haircut and the cheerleader kills her boyfriend who's the quarterback and one book and quarterback kills another cheerleader. It's just formulaic horror movie. So I said, Bertie, read this book and I gave her Treasure Island. And she came down and she was feeling really bad. She said, Dad, I can't read this. I said, why? She said, there's too many words in there that I don't know what they mean. And so I read it again, you know, because he's writing it 150 years ago or whatever. And I said, she's right. So I said, I'm going to write a, a Treasure Island type book, you know, epic in scope and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and write it so that, that modern day kids get the same feeling I got when I read Treasure Island, but there's not going to be words in there they don't know. And, and it's going to, you know, be a much easier read for them. And so that was Nick of Time. And that, hit the, uh, the Times was at number five. And then Time Pirate, which was the sequel where he went to, to Yorktown to help win the Battle of uh, Yorktown, uh, was at four. Wow. So they did it really well. And, and, then, and then I got the Hawk deal and I haven't been able to get to the third one yet. Well, it's, it's, it's nice to be that busy. Uh, I'm curious, you said one of the things that the, the, the lockdown sort of enabled you to do was spend more time writing. Uh, it, in, do you think it's important? <laughs> not important is the wrong word. Do you think about whether or not the reality that we're all going through now needs to be reflected in words of fiction, works of fiction going forward? Not or for me. No, not for me. No, it's just, it's just, you know, there's some things I just instinctively avoid. Like that's one of them. Right. You know, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to 
bring that in because I'm creating a world that people love to be in. And I just, I don't know how it would advance, advance what I'm doing um, just because it's true, you know? Yeah. I, the other one I'd ask you, it seemed to me that in some ways, you, the, the heroes of, of your, of, of both your the f grandfather and, and the grandson in, in the book, right. they're both very much institutionalists, which I mm -hmm. thought, I think is interesting. And because it seems to me there's, these kinds of novels can go in one of two directions. The, the, the hero is either a rogue, right, and is an anti-institutionalist or is an institutionalist. In this case, they're institutionalists. Do you think books like this appeal? And we're living in a time where people have more distrust of institutions than ever before. You know, mm -hmm. they don't trust religion. They don't trust government. They don't trust big food. They don't trust anybody. Yeah. Do you think these books have appealed because they reflect on a time when we could actually trust institutions? I never thought of that, but I wouldn't argue with you about it. You know, it's, you know, that's a great question actually, but I, it's not something I consciously deal with. I just try to make these guys heroic. I mean, heroism is a big theme in all these books. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, cause I, cause I, I, I think about that a lot because I think that it's really important because of my audience being in the retail business uh, and, and the manufacturing business, they're in the business of engendering trust. Yeah. And yet they are institutions. So at a time when institutions are being challenged and are being questioned and are, I don't and don't create trust, how do you leap over that? And yeah. and weirdly enough, I'm reading your book and I'm thinking about the notion of institutional trust and I'm connecting your book to supermarkets. Yeah. <laughs> so, which I know that's a, place, that's a place only you could go to. I can't. Probably. I may be the only person on, on, on the planet. So you're doing, a, you're doing, a, you're hoping to do the, the time travel books as a series? As a series, right. Yeah. So do these as a, this as a movie? Or the, well, we, are, I, we already have a deal for the Hawk books. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a major studio in Hollywood, which I can't name, but um, they, bought, they bought the rights. So now it remains to be seen what they're going to do with it. So you know, you I, mean, have, I have a feeling. Are you going to play, a role? play a role? Are you going to play a role? It is different. Yeah. It can go both ways, right? <laughs> right. Um, I'm not going to be Hawk, though. I'm, I'm Hawk no, no, I mean, I don't mean, a, I don't mean a, an acting role. Are you going to play a role, a creative role in bringing them to the screen? Or have you, have you well, seen I, this is my words? This is my third Hollywood deal. And Paramount bought the rights to Nick of Time right after it came out. Right. And engaged me to write the screenplay, and nothing ever happened. And then a very famous producer, the guy who did um, all the uh, Transformer movies, and he did Perfect Storm, and he did uh, you name it. I mean, the guy is like amazing. And you know, he he called me. I didn't call him. And you know, he was so excited. He flew up to. I was living in uh, San Francisco. He flew up and took me to lunch and told me how much he loved the books, and uh, he wanted me to be a producer. And you want me to be on the set always with the director because I'm the guy who understands how these work. And then nothing happened. And then, which led me to, to announce on some kind of interview, I said, my favorite book about Hollywood is the title is just sucked me in. Hello, he lied. <laughs> yes, I mean, you can't trust. You talk about institutions you can't trust. Is that William Goldman? I can't remember now. No, William Gold is a great script. No, my guy was an, a, a major, major producer. Okay. No, no, I mean the, the, the person who wrote the book, Hello, He oh, Locked. I think that was. I don't think so. I, I think. I have to look that one up. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who said it now, but it said some woman, I think my Sherry Lansing or something, wrote a book okay. called You'll Never Eat Lunch in This Town Again. It's <laughs> about life in Hollywood. Okay. So I'm skeptical about it. Okay. Well, ho hopefully it, it, it all works out. Well, well, listen, I appreciate uh, you're spending time with us today. I, 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 I admire what you've done here. The idea of being able to turn out 11 of these is just extraordinary. And I look forward to the next one. Thank you, Kevin. It's been great being with you. Thanks for joining us on Morning Newsbeat. Take care.